second video of three on our introduction to probability. So let's get at it. All right, so part two. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about um, three important rules for computing probabilities. They are the complement rule, the, I keep forgetting I can point at this thing, complement rule, the addition rule, and the multiplication rule. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, the complement rule. The complement rule <clears throat> is um, useful for computing the probability that something does not occur. Okay, so um, that's what we call the complement of an event. So the complement of an event is denoted AC. Some books call it A prime. They put a little prime symbol up here. Um, some use other notation. The, the point is, They'll use some notation and call it the complement, and that's what you have to keep track of. So the complement of an event um, represents everything that does not associate it with the event, right? So it's the opposite of the event. And the event and its complement are nicely related. So the probability of an event plus the probability of its complement equals one. Why is that? Well, because the event and its opposite constitute everything. So when you look at, when you think about the fact that, the, the, when you consider the fact that anything occurs, that probability is always one. So that's why when you add these, you get one. But you can you know, flip this relationship around a little bit using a little bit of algebra, and you see that the probability of an event is equal to one minus the probability of its complement. And you can write that even another way. Um, sometimes it might be useful to think about it this way. Um, the probability of the complement is equal to one minus the probability of the event. That's another way you could you could do that, and that's just using algebra with the with the first equation here. Okay. Now that's very useful for us because sometimes it's easier to think about and compute the probability of the opposite of the event than it is of the event itself. And so that's great because if we have the opposite, we can then just take one minus that and get the probability that we need. So this is a very useful tool for us. So, you know, if you ever run into a case where you're having a really, really hard time figuring out how to compute this probability, a really good rule of thumb is to try computing the probability of its complement instead, and then just use this formula, okay? So um, let's look at uh, the, these examples here. So the first one is roll a fair six-sided die. Find the probability of not obtaining a five. Okay, so, um, well, what's the probability of the complement of that? Well, the complement of obtaining a five, so if, if the event A is um, uh, not getting a five, that's what we want to find the probability of, then its complement is the opposite of that, which means getting a five. All right, and I can compute the probability of this pretty darn easily, right? The probability of the complement is the probability of getting a five. And we talked in the last video about this. We said that the probability of getting any particular number on a fair six-sided die is one-sixth. So now what's the probability of not getting a five? Well, it's one minus the probability of the complement. So it's one minus probability of the complement, which is one minus one sixth, that's five sixths. So the probability of not getting a five is five sixths. Right? That's how we can use the complement rule to compute a probability. Let's look at the next one. Toss four fair coins. Find the probability of it getting at least one head. Um, um, I think I need this picture here. <laughs> I didn't plan that one ahead. So I need this uh, chart here. So if you toss four fair coins, um, uh, these are the, here's the different number of heads you can obtain. You could get anywhere from zero to four heads. And here's the probabilities, okay? So um, what was the question? Uh, but getting at least one head, okay. Well, I could take the probability of getting one, two, three, and four, and, and think of them all together and try to get it that way. But there's an easier way to do it. I can think about the complement. What's the opposite of a getting at least one head? 
Well, the opposite of getting at least one means I've got none, right? So the complement of at least one head is zero heads, right? And the probability of zero heads is 0 0.0625. So the probability of getting at least one head is one minus the probability of its complement, which was 0, 0.0, what was, what did we say, 625? I already forgot. Yes, 0 0.0625. Oh, uh, that is the probability. I shouldn't write P if I've already computed the probability. One minus 0 0.0625, which is 0 0.9375. So that's the probability of it getting at least one head. It's one minus the probability of getting no heads. Okay? And um, toss a single coin repeatedly until heads. Find the probability that it, you know, we're going to skip this one because I don't have the chart ready for this one. But anyway, I think you get the idea, okay? Uh, for some reason, my charts got erased from the PowerPoint. Okay, so let's move on anyway. Um, <clears throat> next up, the addition rule. The addition rule is, um, is how we handle the word or. So if anybody asks you how to compute the probability of something or something else, this is the rule that you're going to use. Okay. Um, so if A and B are any two events, then the probability that at least one of them occurs, that's the probability of A or B, um, that's equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. All right. And let me draw a picture to illustrate what's going on here. Okay. So if you have event A is over here and event B is over here, then this intersection between them, that's uh, A and B. Those are the things that are in both A and B. So if I want the probability of A or B, I want the probability of landing somewhere in this peanut shape, right? In this thing. So if I want the probability, I have to measure the events that are in here together with the events that are in here. But if I just add them, I've counted this region twice, right? I've counted it when I counted A, and I counted it when I counted B. So if I just add A and B, I've counted these twice. So to undo that mistake, I have to subtract A and B. If I subtract that region once, now I've counted everything exactly once. And that's how this rule is essentially working. And that's why we, it makes sense that there's a minus probability of A and B there, okay? So if uh, I roll a, um, Fair six-sided die, okay, um, and I want to know the probability of getting five or six, all right? Well, this is the probability of getting five plus the probability of getting six minus the probability of getting five and six. Well, what's the probability of getting five? That's one-sixth. What's the probability of getting the number six? That's one sixth. If you don't recall this, watch the previous video. And what's the probability of getting rolling a single die and getting both a five and a six? That's impossible. So that's zero. One sixth plus one sixth minus zero, two sixths. Okay. What about the probability of getting even or odd? Probability of even or odd is the probability, I'll just use E for even and O for odd, minus the probability, let me put a curly on my O so it doesn't look like a zero, E and odd. Well, the probability of getting even is one half, right? And the probability of getting odd is one half because half the numbers are even, half the numbers are odd. The probability of getting an even and an odd number? Well, no even, no numbers are even and odd, so that's zero. 
So I have 1 half plus 1 half minus 0, so the probability is 1. The biggest number the probability can be, which means it's almost certain to happen, right? <laughs> when you roll a die, in fact, in this case, it is certain to happen. What about even or 3? Um, probability of even or 3. Well, that's the probability of even plus the probability of 3 minus the probability of even and 3. Well, the probability of even is a half. Probability of 3 is a sixth. And the probability of getting an even number and 3, well, that's, again, that's 0. Okay? So 1 half plus a sixth. Well, that's 3 sixths plus 1 sixth. That's 4 sixths or 2 thirds. All right? Now, what about the last one? Probability of even or 4. It's the probability of even plus the probability of 4 minus the probability of even and 4. Well, the probability of even is a half. Probability of 4 is a sixth. The probability of even and 4, well, if it's 4, it's automatically even. So this is the same as the probability of getting 4, which is 1 sixth. Not 0 this time. All right, so it's one half plus one sixth minus one sixth. It's one half. Okay, so this is how we use how we do or. You always have to keep. Now sometimes you don't have to worry about the and part because it's zero, um, and we'll talk about this later. These are these are called mutually exclusive events when the and part is zero, but that's not always zero. So you should always include it in the computation just in case. Okay, so don't forget that part. Don't forget this A and B piece. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this top example here. Let's just jump down to this, this bottom one, okay? So uh, draw a card from a well-shuffled deck, all right? We wanna find these probabilities. Now, first of all, let's just um, um, point out that these are, it doesn't matter, fuck. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to skip this top example here. We're going to just go down to this bottom one, okay, just to save some... I don't want to make this video too long. So um, draw a card from a well-shuffled deck. Find the following probabilities, okay? So um, probability of getting spades or diamonds, okay? So, well, I know the probability rule says to take the probability of getting spades plus the probability of getting diamonds and subtract the probability of getting spades and diamonds, okay? Well, what's the probability of getting spades? Well, there are, first of all, notice that each card is equally likely to be chosen, okay? So we can compute it just by taking the number of spades and dividing by the total number of cards. If you count here, you can see there are 13 spades and there are 52 cards. So the probability of getting spades is uh, 13 out of 52, okay? 13 out of 52. Okay. Um, what's the probability of getting diamonds? Well, same thing, because there's the same number of diamonds. And what's the probability of getting a spade and a diamond? Well, it's impossible because they are completely different. They're disjoint items, right? So the total probability there is 26 out of 52. So that's the answer to the first one, 26 out of 52. Okay. Oh, I can't find paper with room on it. Okay, what about the next one here? Probability of getting a two or a three. Well, the probability of getting a two, well, there are four twos in the deck, right? And there are four threes in the deck. So do this one on your own. Let's pause the video and come back, all right? And we'll check our work, okay? Three, two, one. All right, so uh, probability of getting a two is four out of 52 because there are four twos. The probability of getting a three is four out of 52 because there are four threes. And the probability of getting a both a two and a three simultaneously is impossible. You're drawing one card, it has to be one or the other. So that's eight out of 52. Okay. All right. What about the next one? Getting six or a clubs. Well, 
Uh, probability of getting six. Well, there's, but I'm gonna let you do this one on your own, okay? Pause the video to see if you can get it, okay? Three, two, one. Okay, six or clubs. There are four sixes, all right? So the probability of getting six is four out of 52. The probability of getting a clubs, well, there's 13. Now, what's the probability of getting a six and a clubs? Well, that's six and a clubs means we drew this card. That's one out of 52. Okay. So we have four plus 13 minus one. That's 16 out of 52. That's the probability of getting six or clubs. Okay. And then finally, getting a number card or a heart. Okay, do this one on your own. Pause the video. Three, two, one. Okay, let's see what you got here. The probability of getting a number card is, well, that's one of these numbers here, right? How many of them are there? Well, there's nine times four. There's 36, okay? So there's 36 out of 52. That's your probability of getting a number card. What's your probability of getting a heart? Well, there are 13 hearts. So it's 13 out of 52. Now, what's the prob now we have to subtract the probability of getting a, both a number card and a heart. How many cards are number cards and hearts? Well, there's exactly nine of them, right? So you have to subtract nine out of 52. Okay, so what do we got here? We got um, 49 minus 9 is 40 out of 52. Okay. All right, cool. So next up, we have conditional probability. So conditional probability is um, the probability of one event given that another one has occurred. So we have knowledge that one thing has occurred and using that knowledge, we're now going to um, make a judgment on the probability of the other event, all right? Now, because we have some additional knowledge, it might affect the probability. So we have to take that knowledge into consideration. So the probability of A given B is not the same as the probability of A Sometimes it is, but we wouldn't expect it to be all the time, okay? So let's look at this, these examples here. Roll a fair six-sided die. What's the probability of getting a five? We've talked about this before. It's one-sixth. Okay, what's the probability of getting an odd number? Well, half the numbers are odd, so one-half. Okay, what's the probability of getting a five given that the number was odd? So we know the number was odd. So we know the number was either one, three, or five. How many possibilities are there? There's only three. So really what this means is that our sample space now only has three possibilities. So when I say what's the probability that it's five, given that it's odd, there's only one of these three possibilities in which it was a five. So one out of three. So the probability of um, getting of uh, it being five, given that it's odd, is one out of three. Okay, so this one here is one third. Let's line that up there. Okay. What about this one? The probability that's odd, given that it was a five. Well, if I know it's a five, okay, now what's the likelihood that it's odd? Well, it's guaranteed because five is an odd number, right? So that probability is equal to one. Okay, so the first two probabilities were one, well, it was one sixth, one half, one third, one. Okay, now what's a rule that we can use to do this uh, just more systematically? Well, if A and B represent events, then the probability that A occurs given that B has occurred is given by, so this is the A given B, right? It's the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. So notice the event B has become our new sample space. That's what I was saying before when 
now that B has occurred, these are, the, these are the options that we're choosing from. So it's as if B has become the new sample space. So that's why that's in the denominator instead of the original sample space. So let's apply that to do the problems we were just looking at. Um, okay, so um, when I say five given that it's odd, all right, what I can do for that one is I can do the probability that it's five and odd divided by the probability of it being odd. That one. Okay, well, the probability that it's five and odd is the same as it's, it's, it's five and odd, it's just five, right? There's only one number that's five and odd, it's the number five. So that's one out of six. What's the probability of it being odd? Well, half the numbers are odd. That's one out of two. These were our answers up here, by the way. What's one sixth divided by one half? It's one third, just as we said before. Okay. And what about this next one? The probability that it's um, odd given that it's five. Well, uh, it's probability of odd and it's five divided by the probability of it being five. Well, to be odd and five is the same as just being five, because five is an odd number, right? So the probability of being five is one-sixth. And the probability of being five is one-sixth. One-sixth divided by one-sixth is one. Okay? So we kind of went about it two different ways. In the first case, we thought about like, well, if it's odd, then there's only three possibilities, and this is only one of them. So it was one in three, one-third. Uh, and the other way to do it was using this formula, but they both give you the same answer, okay? All right. Next up, we have the multiplication rule, okay? This is for and. We looked at a rule for not, we looked at a rule for or, now we have a rule for and, all right? So um, if A and B are events, then the probability that both A and B occur is calculated as follows. Probability of A times the probability of B given A. Or you can also do this, same, it'll give you the, the <clears throat> same answer. Probability of B times the probability of A given B. Okay, so this is how we do ands. Um, all right, so let's look at this example down here. Draw two cards from a well-shuffled poker deck without replacement. That means I'm gonna draw a card and draw another card without replacing the first one, right? I don't draw one, put it back, and then draw another one. I draw two cards, all right? And um, what's the probability that the first card is a diamond and the second card is a diamond, all right? Well, um, so I'm looking at the probability of getting a diamond and then another diamond. Oops, you can't see what I'm writing, okay? Um, let me write it differently. So we're looking at the probability that the first is a diamond and the second is a diamond, okay? Well, the probability rule up here says it's the probability that the first is a diamond times the probability that the second is a diamond given that the first was a diamond. Okay, well, the probability that the first is a diamond. Well, let's see, how many diamonds are in the deck? There's 13. How many cards are in the deck? There's 52. 13 out of 52. Now, what's the probability that the second is a diamond given that we just drew a diamond? Well, now that we drew a diamond, there is one less diamond in the deck, right? So just, you know, blot that guy out. Right? So what's the probability of drawing a diamond now? Well, now there's only 12 diamonds and only 51 cards. So the probability that the second is a diamond, given that the first drawn was a diamond, is 12 out of 51. Okay? And if you do a little, if 
could compute this on a calculator. 13 times 12 divided by 51 times 52, you get, oh, well, I'll write it as a decimal. To I was hoping it would give me a fraction, but 0 0.0588, okay? Approximately, I'm rounding, okay? Notice how this one, the probability of the second, given the first, you had to take into account that, the, that one diamond was removed, and that's why this given is important, okay? So let's do another one. Okay, uh, the probability that the first card is an ace and the second card is a king. All right, so probability first ace and second king. Well, that's the probability that the first is an ace times the probability that the second is a king given that the first is an ace. Well, what's the probability that the first one is an ace? Well, there's, you know what? I'm gonna let you do this one, all right? So let's pause the video, you work it out, and then we'll compare our answers, all right? So three, two, one. Okay, you got it? Probability that the first is an ace. Well, there's four aces among 52 cards, so that's four out of 52. Now, what's the probability that the second is a king given that we just drew an ace? So there is one ace missing, right? Now, what's the likelihood that you draw a king? Well, there are four cards that are kings, but there's only 51 cards. So it's four out of 51. Right? So if I compute this on a calculator, um, I get um, approximately... 0 0.0060 as my answer, okay? So the multiplication rule, the rule for and, okay? So we had a rule for not, a rule for or, and a rule for and. Let's see what else we've got here. Finally, we have this concept of independent, and I think we'll also talk about mutually exclusive events. All right, so independent events are events where the, the occurrence of one event doesn't affect the occurrence of the other one, okay? Um, so here's some examples. If I toss a coin twice, um, if I toss a coin twice um, and I got heads on the first toss, that's independent, me, that's independent of getting heads on the second toss, right? The second toss has nothing to do with the first toss. So these are completely independent events. Okay. The second example, randomly draw two balls from a bag of red, green, and blue marbles. Um, or, or balls, whatever. Um, if you replace the first ball, shuffle the bag before drawing the second ball, then the two draws are independent because they're both as if you're drawing the first ball. Like they're both exactly the same experiment repeated, right? If you put the ball back and reshuffle the bag, it's, it's like doing the same thing twice. So the second draw is independent of the first. However, if you do not replace the first ball, so if I draw one ball out and then draw a second ball, now that second draw is not independent of the first draw, all right? Because I've reduced the number of balls in the bag and I've removed a color, right? There's one of the first, whatever the first ball's color was, there's one less of that color. So these events are gonna be, these are gonna be called, these are uh, gonna be dependent, all right? Now, uh, if two events happen to be independent, then the probability of A given B is the same as the probability of A, because A doesn't depend on B. And similarly, the probability of B given A is the same as the probability of B, because B doesn't depend on A. So this is a way to check if two events are independent, but this is also a nice fact to know if you happen to know that they're independent already. And in fact, if we go back to the multiplication rule, you can see that um, if the events are independent, then probability of B given A is just the same as the probability of B. So probability of A and B is just the probability of A times the probability of B. Or in the second line, the probability of B, sorry, A and B is just the probability of B times the probability of A, right? But that's only if they're independent events. 
which wasn't the case here, by the way. Okay, But if you happen to know they're independent events, you can ignore that little given symbol there. Okay, so I want to look at an example of the same situation, but we're going to do it where the events are um, uh, independent. Okay, so we're going to draw a card from a poker deck. We're going to replace it, shuffle the deck, and then draw a second card. Okay, and um, I'm just going to look at this situation here, because this is the one we did before. So ignore what I had written before underneath here. Uh, we're just going to compare this to the result that we got before. This is a different situation, because in the other situation, we drew two cards. All right. Here we're drawing a card, putting it back, reshuffling, and drawing a second card. All right. So when I do this, this is going to be the probability that the first is a diamond times the probability that the uh, second is a diamond, given that the first is a diamond. Okay. Well, the probability that the first is a diamond, well, how many diamonds are in the deck? Like we said last time, there are 13, and there's 52 total cards. Right. Now, what's the probability that the second is a diamond, given that the first was a diamond? Well, we put the first card back and reshuffled, so we were basically starting over with a fresh deck. So the probability that the second is a diamond is the same thing. It's 13 out of 52. Okay. And um, if you compute that, you get approximately 0 0.0625. Okay. Notice that that is a different result than we uh, computed the last time, all right? Because in the previous situation, we were looking at the case where we draw, drew um, two cards without replacing the first one, all right? But in this situation, we have replaced the first card, and that makes the two draws uh, independent. All right, and that's why things are a little bit different here. And in fact, um, like I said before, when it's independent, you can just ignore the fact that you drew the first card, right? We just, and that's why these two numbers just ended up being the same, okay? All right. So um, finally, mutually exclusive events, all right? So two events are called mutually exclusive if they cannot both occur at the same time. So, um, some examples. You roll a six-sided die. Rolling a three is mutually exclusive to rolling an even number. Okay? If I roll a three, it's impossible that I rolled an even number, and vice versa. If I rolled an even number, it's impossible that I rolled a three. I think I've got room to live up here again. <laughs> All right? And um, in the second example here, uh, rolling a prime number is not mutually exclusive to rolling an even number. Okay, These are not mutually exclusive because 2 is a possibility. 2 is both prime and even. So here's an example of two events that are not mutually exclusive, being prime and being even. Let's look at the drawing uh, balls from a bag of um, red, green, and blue balls. Right, uh, Drawing two green balls is mutually exclusive to drawing two ball to drawing balls of two different colors. Okay? If I draw two greens, then it's impossible that I drew two different colors. Right? So those are mutually exclusive. However, drawing two green balls is not mutually exclusive to drawing two balls of the same color because if I drew two balls of the same color, it's possible that they were both green. So one event does not exclude the other one. So those are not mutually exclusive. If two events are mutually exclusive, then the probability of A and B is equal to zero. And by the way, that simplifies the OR rule a little bit, because if A and B is zero, then this piece is gone. Right? So if they're mutually exclusive events, this rule simplifies to just P of A plus P of B. So notice both these rules simplify. Right? This rule simplifies if they're mutually exclusive, and this rule simplifies if they're independent. Okay? Do not confuse mutually exclusive with independent. They are completely different things. Okay? Something can be mutually exclusive but not independent and vice versa. Okay? And uh, that is it for this video. So um, hope that was useful for you. I'll see you in the next video.